Welcome to the Thoughtful Thursday broadcast of Wisdom and the Word. We're glad that you're joining us today. If you are joining us via Facebook or YouTube, we want to encourage you to uh, like and to share this out with somebody else. Make a comment. Let us know that you're there. Uh, additionally, if uh, you would share this out with somebody else, uh, encourage other people to listen to the podcast. Uh, perhaps they would like to have their own Bible questions answered or would be interested in the answers to the questions that we're answering from other people. And so um, we appreciate you being able to do that. Just a reminder on uh, some of the things that are happening here as we are uh, heading into the latter part of the month of April. Uh, we do have our Ladies' Day Away coming, on, coming out on Saturday, so the ladies are planning on that. And then next week, uh, the ladies also have their circle of ours, Think Pink. And so that's coming up Friday and Saturday as they plan uh, their uh, circle of ours uh, ladies retreat, which happens every year. And then, of course, uh, we've got some other things scheduled in the month of May, things that are coming very, very quickly. We're doing some follow-up still this week from uh, Easter Sunday and all the good things that the Lord did for us in that week. So we're going to continue today in our wisdom in the word, and uh, we're going to answer a question today from one of our listeners. And I love it when our listeners ask questions that send us down a proverbial wormhole. And uh, that's where we're going today, down a little wormhole. I'm not sure we'll emerge with an answer, but we'll certainly emerge with some more information about the topic. So I'm going to take just a brief break, and then we'll get this podcast here officially started on the audio version. Welcome to Thoughtful Thursday. This is Wisdom in the Word. We're glad that you're joining us today. We're looking forward to taking some time to answering your questions as we do each and every Thursday. And today, our listener asks a question from Genesis chapter number 9. So have your, have your Bibles. Please follow along with us in Genesis 9. The Bible uh, tells us in Genesis 9.22 that Ham saw the nakedness, nakedness of his father who was lying uncovered in his tent. Why did God curse Ham for this, seeing this was not his fault? So that's our question for today. Um, so we're going to go back to Genesis 9, and we're going to look at the story and what happens. Of course, um, after the flood takes place, we find um, that Noah began to be a husbandman in verse number 20. That is, he plants a vineyard. And after he plants a vineyard, we find that he drinks of the wine of his own wine, and he becomes drunken, and he was uncovered. His nakedness was uncovered in the tent. Now, the Bible says in verse number 22 that Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. So the bigger question here is, as this develops, Ham shares this information with uh, his two brothers, Shem and Japheth. And they come in, they take a garment, they laid it upon both their shoulders, and they go backward and they cover the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backwards, and they did not see the nakedness of their father. Uh, they did not want to draw attention, attention to his shame. And so then we find Noah awakes from his, from his wine, and the Bible says, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And then in verse 25, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be unto his brethren. So then from there, he pronounces a curse. So the question is, uh, Ham just came in and saw the nakedness of his father, uh, who was lying uncovered in his tent. Why did God curse him for doing this, seeing that this wasn't his fault? Well, this is one of the more difficult passages to be able to understand. Really, when you ask a question like this, you're dealing with a, a Bible question that has stumped many, many scholars, going all the way back uh, to the book of Genesis, chapter number 9, in the beginnings. So we understand Noah's story. We know that he was a, a man who, by faith, he built an ark, and, and God destroyed the world by flood, and then he had his three sons and their wives with him. And after afterwards, uh, they replenished, repopulated the earth. Uh, they all moved in different directions, and God used them uh, in a great way to be able to repopulate the earth because Noah had found grace in God's eyes, and he built a boat. And he survived the, the flood uh, that came. And on the post side of the flood, one of the things that Noah took up is he became a husbandman and he began, became a, a grew a vineyard and he drank of that wine and he got drunk. Now, all that being said, we kind of understand a little bit what's happening here in this story. But we've got to get some, there's some clues here about why this happened. First of all, let me answer the question. I think the question can be answered um, fairly easily. Why did God curse Ham 
for this, seeing this was not his fault? Well, first off, the indictment on Ham in this passage is not really just the seeing of his father's nakedness. The issue was, if you'll notice in verses 22 and 23, the way this takes place, he sees the nakedness of his father and he goes and he tells his two brethren. That is, why would Ham see the nakedness of his father and then go and tell his two brethren, his two brothers, that their father was naked? Why would he not cover him himself? And then in verse 23, Shem and Japheth come in, they take a garment, they lay it upon him, and they go backward and cover up their father's nakedness. And of course, verse 24, Noah awakes from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. Now, when you look at the way that this is framed, it seems clear here that what we're dealing with, and you'll notice the way that it's, this is always phrased. Notice in verse 18, the Bible says, And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. Notice in verse 22, And Ham, the father of Canaan, right? So a couple of times right here, just within a few verses, it makes note of the fact that Ham had a son whose name was Canaan. Now, why is this significant? Because Canaan land, where the, these people are going to go and they're going to settle, Canaan becomes the father of all of these different groups of people that end up basically fighting against the children of Israel as they come, in, they come into the land that God has given them. On top of that, Canaan is cursed in verse 25 down through uh, verse number 27 uh, because of because of his sin. And so it seems here that the reason why Ham is cursed is not because he is he saw his father's nakedness, but rather he is cursed because of his naughtiness or the way that he handled the situation. That is, he didn't cover his father, but rather he went out and he told his brethren about it instead of covering him up himself. So this kind of lends to Ham's um, Ham's personality, his character, his faith. Uh, many people believe that based on what's happening here in this passage, that Ham has abandoned the faith of his father and that he is going to become or has become an idolater. We know that the people of Canaan, that Canaan himself and the people of Canaan would become idolaters. And so it, it seems very clear here that that possibly is what's going on, that the punishment that is given to Ham is not just given to him on the basis of the fact that uh, that he was, you know, saw his father's nakedness, but rather how he reacted to his father's nakedness in not taking care of it himself, going out and telling his brethren, just the kind of person that he was. Now, let me say this as we go through. If you look at verse 25 to 27, where the curse is pronounced, I want to make this clear. There doesn't seem to be a curse on him but rather a curse of Cain and his son. There's no evidence here that this curse is, is Ham's curse. This curse is Canaan's curse. Now, is Canaan's curse related to? How is this Canaan, Canaan's curse? Well, get this. Ham had four sons, uh, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. All right, those were his four sons. But only Canaan was cursed, right? The Canaanites... Abundant wickedness proved the curse was warranted. And as a result, they were enslaved by a coalition of Eastern kings, by the Israelites during the conquest, and by Solomon during his reign as king. So the curse here, you'll notice in verse 25, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. That is, these people are going to be servants, and they're going to be slaves to their brethren. And, of course, that's the curse that is placed upon them. This, is, this was true. Canaan was cursed. And they did become enslaved by a coalition of Eastern kings, right? So the curse here is placed upon Canaan. It is not placed upon Ham. It is likely that Canaan followed in the footsteps of his father. He followed in the footsteps of his father, Ham. And that's the reason why it says multiple times that Ham was the father of Canaan. Now, as we go through this, we kind of kind of unravel up it's almost like untangling a cord here. Have you ever tried to had a knot in something and tried to untangle it? This passage is a knot that has to be untangled a little bit. And so bear with me as we go through. Now, the basic question concern, concerns what Ham, Noah's youngest son, did, right? So it says here in verse 24, Noah awoke from his wine and knew that his younger son 
had done unto him. Okay, so, so the question here is, why Noah cursed Ham's son Canaan, and what Ham, Noah's youngest son, did? It seems clear here that Ham, I always thought that Ham was the middle son. It seems Ham is the, is the youngest son, all right? Now, many fanciful ideas have been proposed as to what he did. You'll notice in verse 24, when Noah awakes from his wine, he knows what his younger son has done unto him, right? So when you're looking here at this particular text, what his younger son has done unto him, what is it that's been done? Uh, Noah awakes and he realizes it. Now, a there's a lot of fanciful ideas, all right? None of them are rooted in what the Bible text says, but their ideas. Now, the rabbis said Ham castrated Noah, thus explaining why Noah had no other sons. So that's what the rabbis believe. Others claim that Ham slept with his mother, thus uncovering his father's nakedness. That the phrase to uncover nakedness here in this passage dealt with the fact of going in unto uh, someone's wife. That that's what that phrase meant. So, and they believe that Canaan was the offspring of that union right? That Canaan was born as a result of what he did. Again, no proof in the text, but that's an idea. Others have said that Ham was involved in a homosexual attack on his father, that when he woke up and found out what his younger son had done, that he had violated him in that, in that moment. So there's a lot of ideas about this and a lot of speculation, but there's no 100% ironclad uh, confirmation because we don't have it in the Bible. The Hebrew expression here means what it says. Literally, it just means this. Ham saw his father's nakedness. That is, he was not involved with Noah sexually, for in that case, the Hebrew would be translated, he uncovered his father's nakedness, right? Instead, Noah had already uncovered himself, and Ham saw him that way. So there's a different way that's the con constructed. Now, to the ancients, however, even seeing one's father naked was a breach of a family ethic. They were not allowed to do this. The sanctity of the family was destroyed and the strength of the father was made a mockery. Ham apparently stumbled on this accidentally, but went out and exulting told his two brothers as if he had triumphed over his father. And almost in a mocking or a joking kind of way is the way that, that that's constructed and that could be potential. And again, the, all these other scenarios are possibilities of what happened. Now, Hebrew theology recognized that due to parental influence, future generations usually committed the same acts as their fathers, whether for ill or for good. So this is the connection between Ham and Canaan. Ham and Canaan are connected because in the Hebrew mind, oftentimes the son went out and did in excess what the, what the father did in moderation. In this case, the curse is directed at Ham's son, as Ham's just deserts for the disrespect he had towards his own father, Noah. Yet the imprecation was spoken against future generations of Canaanites who would suffer subjugation, not because of the sins of Ham, but because they themselves acted like Ham because of their own transgressions, right? So what we're seeing here is a prediction. It's a curse, but it's a prediction. It's a prophecy. Noah literally prophesies here of what Canaan's descendants are going to be, right? And he's doing that on the basis of the way that Ham acts, the way that Canaan acts, and what's going to happen. But this is God giving Noah a, a premonition of what's going to happen, right? So those deplorable acts by the Egyptians and Canaanites are sexual aberrations that merited their dispossession by Israel and thus were forbidden by Moses as obscene offenses against the Lord. Leviticus 18, 3 to 30, they are warned not to do what the Canaanites do. Ham had apparently turned away from the faith of his father. Basically, in the core of his being, Noah was a very godly man, despite the fact that he had a serious and tragic fall at this point in his life. Noah had been chosen and used by God in a great way. He was a true preacher of righteousness. We know that. Uh, we don't expect perfection. We shouldn't expect in the Bible perfection from humans, from humanity, even from our heroes. There is no perfection. And this is Noah's slip up in his life. Ham, if his heart had been right with God, could not have shown such dishonor and scorn 
towards such a godly man as Noah, no matter how far the godly man had fallen. That is, you would think he would have stumbled upon his nakedness, covered him, and covered his shame, and spoken about it to no one else, right? But, and again, again this is not what happened. In fact, no true believer can show dishonor and scorn, scorn toward any person, no matter how terrible a sinner the person may be. True believers just do not dishonor, ridicule, and scorn other persons. This could be the chief reason why Ham felt, felt so much ill towards his father. He felt dissatisfied and unfulfilled because he had rejected both the God and the preaching of his father. Perhaps he had come to a place where while he'd been rescued from, from the, the flood, he simply rejected the faith of Noah and rejected his father and did not have any respect for him. Now, we know God convicted Noah and, Noah and Noah repented. You say, how do you know this? Well, because God moved upon Noah with the spirit of prophecy. These next verses, when Noah speaks prophetically, God's not going to give him those prophecies unless Noah is repentant, right? Now, remember, Noah's three sons stood at the head of the three branches of the human race. The three sons... The three branches of the human race now become the focus of Scripture, from Genesis 9, 24, all the way to 11, 32. God is leading Noah to reveal the future of the three branches of the human race. It's critical to know this. Noah is not reacting against Ham in this passage, for Noah stands as guilty as his son, if not more guilty, because of his call and position as a minister of righteousness. What's happening is due to God. God is using Noah and the terrible incident to predict the future of the human race. And so there's a connection here. Ham, who perhaps, perhaps abandoned his faith, dishonored his father in this moment, has a son whose name is Canaan, and God is using Noah to predict what Canaan's descendants are going to be and what they're going to do. It's not just a curse upon Canaan. It is a prediction of what Canaan, the Canaanites are going to be. Understand, first, oh, we have to understand, Canaan was already walking in the footsteps of his father, living a sensual life and denying the faith of the God of Noah. Scripture definitely teaches that a man sows what he reaps and that the sins of the father are passed down through, the, through generation after generation. Life demonstrates this truth time and time again. That is, when we say passed down, uh, one generation doesn't pay for the sins of the father's, but they borrow those sins and they take those sins that have been done in moderation and they do them in excess. Unfortunately, a father sins and falls. Although he might regret his sin and even repent, his son still follows in his sinful footsteps and never repents. So the influence of parents upon their children is undeniable. Their influence is great, almost incomprehensible. For example, we know today how influential parents are through their genes and behavior. Every child inherits the genes of their parents and also follows the behavior of their parents to a large extent. This does not mean that a child cannot break the behavioral pattern of a, of a bad parent. He can. He can choose to act differently, to behave properly, to live a good and moral life, but most of them do not. Most continue on in the kind of immoral life that their parents lived. Apparently, Canaan, Canaan followed a sinful path in life following in the footsteps of, of his father, Ham. And that's the reason why they're connected together. Noah observed his evil, and under the inspiration of God's spirit, Noah prophetically uttered the curse, the course of Canaan's life in a curse. In addition, Noah saw that the impact of a father's influence upon his son was to be demonstrated time and again down through the history and the seed of Canaan. And so in this text, this is not a curse on Ham. He's not cursing Canaan for Ham's sake. Yes, Ham dishonored his father, but God is using this incident to open the door for, uh, for Noah to be able to prophetically share what is going to happen to Canaan and Canaan's descendants as, as they continue on in the sin of Canaan as well as the sin that they had learned from Ham. Secondly, the very name Canaan means submissive one. It comes from the Hebrew meaning to stoop, to submit, to bend, or to subjugate. Why would Ham give his baby son such a name? Ham had to be thinking of obedience, of the submission a son owed his father. Was Ham a tyrannical, perhaps abusive father? We don't know. The great Old Testament commentators, Keel and Delich, think so. They would say, the father, when he gave them him this name, thought only of submission to his own commands. 
And so it seems that perhaps what we're seeing is even though Ham got on the boat and even though Ham was 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 open to what his father said and survived the flood, that post-flood, he was not a godly man, that he had rejected Noah, that he spurned Noah's preaching. He, he actually dishonored his father by not covering his nakedness and telling his brothers. And he has a son, Canaan, who's following in his steps. And Canaan goes out and Noah is using this incident to be able to predict what is going to happen to Canaan's sons and daughters as they move away, the kinds of people that they're going to be. And this is what happens here. So going back to our original question, Ham saw the nakedness of his father and was lying uncovered in his tent. Why did God curse Ham? Well, the truth of the matter is God didn't curse Ham. Um, Ham was making his own choices. He, was making, he made his own bed, and he was going to have to lie in it. The curse that's given here seems to be to his son Canaan, but not for Ham's sins. It's a prophetic mention of the fact that this incident is going to be representative of the things that the Canaanites are going to do. And it very possibly was something that Canaan learned from his father, Ham. Well, it's kind of like a little cord to untangle, and I hope that you've stuck with us throughout this process while we've tried to untangle the cord a little bit to be able to understand what's happening here in Genesis chapter number nine. And I'll tell you, we've got, uh, we've got about four more questions here. I hope that you will. If you have a question, we'll submit them to us, and we'll continue on studying here at Wisdom in the Word, answering your questions on these thoughtful Thursday episodes. We want to thank you for joining us today. On Tuesday, we'll continue on in our study of the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11. We hope that you'll join us for those next few verses. We're so glad that you've joined us today here at Wisdom in the Word. Have a wonderful day, and God bless.